Welcome back. This last section has to do with universal gas laws and how are we going to treat the gases so that we can more simply look at all the gases and compare them together. We're going to look at how gases will deviate from the ideal and attempt to deal with that in various ways. Okay, so resuming more or less where we left off, look at a gas's compressibility. So how well will a gas compress compared to the expected amount? Now, if we look at the compressibility of just CO2, look at this curve right here, you notice that there's a nonlinear compressibility at 200, that 200, it, the compressibility like shifts down and a high pressure and then it goes back up. As we increase the temperature, this swoop gets less and less till we get almost linear compressibility. Now, I'll discuss this. This is the error between the ideal gas and either the Van der Waal gas or the Bradley Kwong equation. We need to look at what we call the compression factor or Z. We're not going to really use this outside of this chapter and we're barely gonna use this at all. But the compression factor is looking at essentially the molar volume actual versus the molar volume that you would predict for the ideal gas. Or essentially P over Vm over RT. Now, if this was ideal, PV over RT should be one. And for an ideal gas, it is. But what we see more often than not is that Z is not equal to one. Z could be greater, Z could be less than one. If a gas is greater than one, it is either gonna be, it's more difficult to compress than what we had thought. It's more resistant to pressure. With less than one, you say, oh, it could be much, much easier to compress than what you would expect from an ideal gas. As we see in the chart, Z is a function of temperature as well as pressure. So Z is going to change, could change as pressure increases. So what we're, what we're seeing here is that at the lowest of low temperatures, it the gas is very easy to push together until it gets a critical pressure. And then any further, it starts to get closer to what we'd expect. So surpasses that and now it's harder to expect to compress it even further. At higher temperatures, the gas almost immediately deviates from expected and is harder to compress from the ideal. And it just keeps on getting harder and harder to compress as we increase in pressure. But one thing we note on all, all these curves is that as pressure approaches zero, we approach the ideal, we approach compressibility factor of one. And gases will approach the ideal at low pressures and we can deal with that. Now to better understand that, we'll look at another proof. We need to look at how does the compressibility over P relate to the compressibility R RT VM at a constant temperature. And how, so pulling RT out, compressibility relate to one over the molar volume. So specifically, we're gonna look at this with respect to Van der Waals gas, the proof of as the pressure approaches zero, what's the limit for compressibility over P? So pull up the proof. Start our last proof of the chapter, thankfully. Starting from our limit of our Van der Waals gas. So let's define what we're, we're solving for the limit. Finding for the limit where as P approaches zero, how does this change? 
where we were defined Z as equal to P VM over RT. And P is equal to RT over VM minus B because of the band of walls, A over VM squared. So, plugging this equation in for P, we, see, we get that Z equals RT over BM minus B minus A over BM squared VM over RT. Now, factor these through. Factor these through and we get that Z is equal to VM over VM minus B, because RT and RT cancels out, and minus A over VM RT, because one of the VMs cancels out. So here is our Z equation in terms of just molar volume and temperature, not pressure. So looking how this changes with regards to pressure, uh, we're going to say, how does, as a way of saying, how does this change with regards to, we're saying, okay, so looking at the, the original limit, we are saying, is the same as saying, we're looking at the limit of the DZ over DP is equal to VM. How does this change? over the change in RT over VM. We're extracted the P's. So we're looking at how does this change with regards to this? So let's look at that. Actually, I'm going to select all except, let's see if I can. No, that's not where I want to go. I'll do this, delete. I'll look at just, we'll leave those up. So let's look at that. Let's extract our RT from the bottom. So we have, so what we have is one, we have one over RT equal what times D VM over VM minus B minus A over VM RT over D one over VM. So we're just essentially looking at, because well, how can we extract those? Remember, because it's at constant temperature. Now, this is kind of like what we did with Gibbs. That, that one over VM is hard to calculate, the change in one over VM, but dVM is easy to calculate. So one thing we can do is use the inverse rule that we can say that, well, dVm over d over 1 over vm is equal to d1 over vm dVm all raised to the negative first. Okay. 
And so, and if we do that, what is this? How does that change? Well, if you do the derivative with the d1 over vm to the, with regards to the molar volume, you get, well, that's gonna be so, so you're gonna get that this is gonna be equal to negative vm to the negative squared, all to the negative first, which is gonna give us negative vm squared. So we have this, we have this handy conversion. So in order to make this simpler, we're gonna multiply both sides by dvm over dvm. So we're gonna take that ugly thing right there and multiply that by dvm. So that's the identity rule again. So what we have here is factoring the dvm out, we have one over RT dvm over d over one over vm d over vm vm minus b minus a vmrt dvm so we know that we just found that and now we can solve this ugly thing in regards to just vm so simplify simplify what we got. We have negative Vm squared. We have negative Vm squared for RT. Now let's start our derivative. Our derivative of this. Okay. Now derivative of that. So we have to evaluate the product rule, which is a pain, but it's doable. Okay. So the product rule of Vm over Vm minus B is the product rule of the top part gives me one over Vm minus B. The, the bottom part gives me negative, the, the VM stays the same on negative VM, VM minus B squared. So the, I've now taken care of that first term. Now the second term. So negative, so V one over VM now becomes like positive, a over Vm squared RT. Okay. So now, so now we have that all taken care of. And now we can evaluate by factoring all those in. Okay, so factoring made Vm squared RT. Actually, we're gonna simplify first. Sorry, I jumped ahead of myself. So we're gonna simplify to get everything in terms. Well, let's simplify this to Vm. So this term, get the Vm minus B to Vm minus B squared. So Vm minus B times Vm minus B means that's gonna be Vm minus B over Vm minus B squared. So, and if we minus Vm, they, these terms will cancel out to give us negative b over vm squared. And we still have a negative a over rt vm squared. And now 
now we're going to factor in the negative vm squared. Factor those in. To help simplify. So that's going to then vm, negative vm squared makes this vm squared over well, vm squared b over vm minus b squared I have to get the one over rt minus oh sorry so that was a plus i lost that plus somewhere along the way so that becomes minus again a over rt So okay, we got there. Now we're ready, ready to find the thing. As as uh, we're ready to do the limit. As pressure approaches zero at a constant temperature, volume will approach infinity. Volume will approach infinity. So, that in mind, infinity over infinity will be one. So, so as pressure approaches zero, this whole term will approach B. So in Vm squared over Vm minus B squared will approach one. And thus, so we get, as pressure approaches zero, we get B minus A over RT times one over RT. And so, And all that's equal to zero. So we can get rid of that. And we can get that B equals A over RT. What is compressibility approaches? Uh, how does compressibility change with pressure at a constant temperature? as pressure approaches zero. Well, let's say B over ART, essentially, if we solve this in terms of just temperature, we can say that temperature equals A over BR. So saying as pressure approaches zero, compressibility becomes like an ideal gas when we get to a point where the temperature approaches A over BR or RB for that same gas. So that so that the compressibility gets like a ideal gas at this specialized temperature. And we call this the boil temperature. Boil temperature. The temperature where a real gas best approaches an ideal molar volume under uh, decreasing pressure conditions. Now, I don't really like the boiler gas too much, the bowl temperature. So hard to calculate. I mean, it seems relatively simple, but it's uh, not super accurate. Bowl temperature uses A and B, and so it's gas dependent. But even then, it's more qualitatively accurate than purely quantitative. And that is so hard to really wrap your head around considering the fact physical chemistry is beyond a doubt a very quantitative thing to be able to say like, I'm gonna predict this to the third significant figure within so many accuracy to be able to say, well, it's kind of, good, then it's so hard to really wrap your mind around why we would even bother to do that. So.
but it is what it is. But so the, the, the purpose of the boil temperature is trying to predict whether uh, the compressibility should be positive or negative. Let's say if the temperature is above this boil temperature, the, repul the repulsive forces will dominate and thus the gas becomes harder to compress. If the temperature is below the boil temperature, the attractive forces will dominate and the gas will be easier to compress. But remember, at high pressures, repulsive potential will always dominate regardless of what temperature we're at. But it, even so, it's still not an exact science. One of the last major things is looking at the universal gas equation. Z will provide us with a convenient way to look at how do gases deviate between real and ideal. But when we use the van der Waal equation or read the quantum, it's still a very material dependent. And so it's kind of hard to compare gas A to gas B. So what we want to do is to actually write a gas equation that is not dependent on which gas, which is thus the universal gas equation. Now gases differ based on the molar volume and the attractive potential. But remember, the critical temperatures and the critical pressures can be related to these constants. So, uh, so the idea that at critical temperature can be is related to attractive potential. So as the gas with high attractive potential will remain liquid longer and thus have higher critical temps. Same thing with critical molar volume is related to minimum molecular volume. So in general, the idea here is gases should behave similarly at similar values of temperature, pressure, and volume if we measure them relative to their critical constants. So we get what's called a reduced variable when you take the pressure it's actually at and divide it by its critical pressure. If we take the temp, we get the reduced temperature. If we take the temperature it's actually at, divided by our it's temperature critical. And the same thing with the reduced molar volume. So from there we get the law of corresponding states. The idea that two gases, if they have the exact same reduced pressure, reduced temperature, and reduced molar volume, they will be under very similar conditions. They will be in corresponding states with each other. And this is regardless of the gas identity. So the actual pressure, temperature, and molar volume. So saying like, look at all this data here, that we're comparing methane, ethylene, ethane, propane, and butane, isopentane, and heptane, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and water. And water is the one of the greatest deviators here you would expect. So you, except for a few changes, you can see like, oh, they're fitting on here. Under this, all these isotherms, you can see how the compressibility is changing in regards to reduced pressure. That through the reduced pressure, the, the, yes, yeah, essentially, this, you would expect each gas to act differently, but since it's the relative reduced pressure, saying the compressibility factor is deviating by the same amount because of when you're comparing the relative pressures. And now a different isotherm. Isotherm of 1, 1.1, 1.2, 1 1.3. See, it's changing, and you're seeing a very good following of the compressive the expected compressibility when we look at these reduced variables. So using the reduced variables, we can remove the A and the B from the van der Waals and the Red Lequan equation, saying that if we have P reduced times P critical, T reduced times T critical, the reduced variables in these, the whole equation would drop out. We can kick out the the BMC, plugging those in. We can move the critical constants. Oh God, we need another proof. Well, 
I'm gonna go ahead and wave my hands. We're not gonna prove this. You could prove this on your own. I'm gonna leave that as something that could be done. But we're gonna remove that and then just skip it and just say that our universal gas constant, you're essentially plugging these in for your criticals and factoring them in and you find all your A's and your B's and all that cancel out and you're left with just your equation in regards to reduced variables. Your pressure reduced is related to eight, temperature reduced over three, um, molar volume reduced minus one, minus three over molar volume reduced squared. So essentially like, oh, if I have these two variables for a gas, I can predict this. And and you can use that reduced pressure that could fit with any other gas. That'll work with any other gas because it, each other gas has its own critical pressure and critical temperatures. Now, this works for a wide variety, but it works best when you can have spherical nonpolar gases. So you get like some like very oblong gases that some that are very polar. They can deviate a bit more. <coughs> Let's go back to that equation and see what guys deviate. Ethylene seems to be some sort of deviation and ethane maybe. Ethane or nitrogen maybe doing the, the deviation right there. Right, ethane. So, but this is equation to see trends for gases with respect to compression and pressure and or temperature. But this leads to our last and final topic, fugacity. Nothing to do with sopranos. Hey, yo, what's the, what's the fugacity up with you? You know? No. Ideal gas. It, for ideal gas, we talked about chemical potential. Chemical potential for gas is equal to the standard chemical potential at a standard pressure. And we have to affect it for its pressure over pressure initial. So like, for example, if it's at two bars instead of one bar, we'd have to calculate the chemical potential, how that would have changed. Well, for a real gas, remember, there's gonna be a deviation from the expected ideal gas. So we have to treat this from, instead of the pressure, but fugacity potential. So fugacity is essentially the effective pressure for a real gas. It comes down to how does it deviate based on the compression factor Z. When the attraction between molecules is dominant, the, uh, the Gibbs real is less than the Gibbs ideal. And thus fugacity is less than our pressure. So lower pressure than what you'd expect ideal. If the repulsion dominates, where well, Gibbs energy is greater than the ideal, and thus fugacity is greater than our expected pressure. So we're just trying to get things a little bit more accurately. But one thing we can say about fugacity is that fugacity will approach the ideal pressure as pressure approaches zero. So F standard and P standard are both one bar. How are we gonna calculate fugacity? Well, we can do that because we can find the Gibbs molar, like ab absolute Gibbs molar value based on the molar, the molar volume times the change in pressure. So that we can say that our change in chemical potential of ideal is equal to the molar volume ideal times change in pressure. And then your chemical potential, change in chemical potential for a real gas is the molar real gas, molar volume for real gas change in pressure. So starting with this, we can say, how is the molar volumes changing between those two with changing pressure? We can integrate with respect to P. Saying that essentially, from P to P zero, we can calculate this, which allows chemical potential to simplify to essentially RT ln fugacity over fugacity 
naught minus RT P over P naught integration of that. So isolated for fugacity, we can say LN fugacity, LNP plus R one of RT, this hot mess. But of course, then we can plug this in. Finally, we'll place T and VM with uh, compression to get the relationship of VM over VM ideal, or PVM over RT, so that uh, VM over RT is equal to Z over P. So now Z is at ideal is equal to one. Essentially, we're getting that here, the fugacity is related to natural log of P plus integration from zero to P of the compression factor minus one over P. Essentially, it, long story short, we get that fugacity is equal to the pressure times the activity coefficient, the fugacity coefficient, is a function of pressure and temperature. Fugacity coefficient, it relates to the ideal pressure to the fugacity or the actual pressure to, to the compression time. We're not really gonna calculate this. This is more of a hot mess than really being useful. But it, essentially, it's like the activity coefficient to calculate the activity of ions in solution like you might have done for analytical chemistry. So, but once again, the fugacity coefficient is a function of pressure and temperature and so. But one way we can apply this is we could actually look at change Kp to Kf to look at a real gas if we wanted to. Now, are we going to? Probably not. But you can use that to correct for a real gas if you were, say, going into doing some hardcore engineering stuff. But that's we're not really going to use that. That is a very impractical constant. So we don't have to worry about that nearly as much as say, how do we calculate A and B of a real gas? That's a little bit more useful than say the fugacity. But some of those terms will come back maybe a little bit later. But that is the end of chapter seven. So best of luck as you work through uh, this chapter. It's a little bit of a hot mess at the very end, but it's still hopefully a lot easier than chemical potential. I'll see you on the flip side.